If you're just joining us, we're journeying through the letter of Ephesians written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And we're sort of reading over their shoulder a little bit. We're, we're learning what we can about them and we're gleaning what truths we can from this letter for our lives that are still applicable to us today in 2023. Uh, and in a way, last week sort of uh, represents a turning point for us. Pastor Stephanie did a fantastic job in Ephesians chapter four, wrestling with what unity in the body of Christ looks like. And, and we're gonna un- unpack uh, uh, from there and, and look at the end of chapter four as part of what we do today uh, and pick up where she left off. But as I mentioned, chapter four is sort of this turning point. In chapters one through three, Paul has focused on, so far, on what Jesus did, the things that he did, that Jesus loved us by becoming human and dying for humanity, that those who believe in Jesus, our entire lives can be changed. We're given a new identity. He transfers us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Because of what Jesus did, the, the division between us and God is torn down and we have access to the Father. Uh, we talked about how we've been made one family in Jesus Christ, both Jews and Gentiles, and how Jesus takes residence in us through the Holy Spirit. And, and, and all these things are things that Jesus did. But one of the reasons this is a turning point is we're getting to our part. You see, we have a part to play in this kingdom relationship. Any relationship isn't one way, it's two way. And far too many Christians don't live out their faith relationally, we live it out transactionally. We think about what Jesus has done for us and we're like, that's awesome. And we, we, we choose to accept him by grace through faith, we're forgiven and, and we kind of complete the transaction and we go, okay, I'm saved now. But for us, it was about that transaction. It was about receiving that gift and we forget this isn't transactional, it's relational. This is a relationship we're getting into, and though there's nothing we can do to, to earn our free gift of salvation, we do actually have to choose that gift. We have to accept it, and then there is a part we have to play. There's sort of expectations that go along with living out a life of faith. Uh, a great example is when you get married. When you get married, there is the wedding day, and there is a contractual moment for sure in that wedding day uh, where you're making promises about to each other about what this will look like, but after the wedding, you have to actually live that stuff out. And anybody who's married knows that marriage takes work. It's a, it's a relationship. It takes two to make a marriage great, okay? The same with our relationship with God. This is a covenant that God made with us for sure. And like marriage, it takes work. And like marriage, it takes two. And in chapters four to six, Paul is beginning to describe the Christian life and to define it from the standpoint of what is expected of us as followers of Jesus. There's an expectation uh, of unity, you know, within the greater body uh, of Christ. There's, there's a call to live as children of light, which is what we're going to talk about today. So what does that actually mean? Well, turn to Ephesians 4 with me. Uh, we'll be on page 705 again. If you didn't bring your Bibles, you can raise your hand. The ushers would like to come around and bring you one. You can turn to page 705 uh, today, we're going to be mostly in Ephesians chapter 5, but we, we need to grab this stuff uh, from the end of Ephesians chapter 4. We need to set the stage here a bit by looking at a few short passages. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 says this, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander from the life God, far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against them. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and they eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Now this could be stated about the world we're living in today. Culture is lost. People are hopelessly confused and far from God. Their minds are full of darkness and they need the light. And the worst part is most people in this condition don't even know they're in this condition. And it's within that world that we have a call as believers, and it's within that context that we understand what God's expectation is of us as his children. Pick it up, verse 20. But that isn't what you learned about Christ, that lifestyle, the things we just talked about. That's not what you learned about Christ. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. 
This is the call we're going to be unpacking today. So what does it mean to live out your calling? Chapter 5 in my Bible is titled Living in the Light. So what does that mean? What does it mean to live our lives in the light of Jesus Christ in the midst of a dark, dark culture? And what we, uh, what we, what is it we learned about Christ that Paul's referring to uh, from Ephesians chapter four into Ephesians chapter five? This is a message that uh, Jesus was passionate, passionate about, okay? If you go back to Jesus' life, this picture of light is all over the gospel. In, in John chapter one, we read these words. The word, that's Jesus, gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus came as the light of this world. In fact, he even referred to himself that way in John chapter eight, which we'll get to in a minute here. But let me set the stage for the words of Jesus. Jesus is uh, standing in the crowded temple area at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a week-long celebration that was all about how God had sustained Israel in the wilderness and how he led them with a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire to light their way at night. So literally a pillar of light at night. And at the final night of the feast, they would all participate in the ceremony. And the ceremony was called the, Ill the illumination of the temple. And in the ceremony, they would light these four giant candelabras, which were as high as the temple walls, each holding 65 liters of oil. And, and they would literally light up this temple. And, and we have a picture here for you. It literally, you could see it from all around, okay? And the whole city would radio with beams of light, okay? This has just happened. The very next day, Jesus is standing in that same temple area, a, a temple that the night before had been illuminated by light, and he made this statement about himself in John chapter eight, verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. This is, this is Jesus claiming to be God in the flesh. He's claiming to be the one who leads us to life, who leads us to light. And he's calling us to follow him just like Israel had followed the pillar of fire in the wilderness. This is what Paul's referring to when he says to the Ephesians, hey, the non-believing world is living in darkness, but that's not what you learned about Christ. We know he's the light that brings life to everyone. And Paul is calling us to put on our new nature and he's reminding us you're created to actually be like God. And that brings us to our passage in chapter five. And uh, as Paul works to unpack what it means to live in the light, I gotta tell you, it's not an easy calling we have. So flip over to Ephesians chapter five and as you turn there, uh, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, and you can just respond out loud. These are not trick questions, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you. Was Jesus known for his love for lost people? Yes or no? Yes, he ab absolutely was, okay? Did Jesus ever make excuses for people's sins? No, he did not. He did not ever make an excuse for people's sins. So Jesus somehow managed to walk this tension in his life that most of us as Christians are miserable walking in. We live in a culture that has no tolerance for disagreement. So we're, we live in a culture where if you tell someone, I think you might be wrong, that's like hate speech, right? There's no room for disagreement. And yet Jesus managed to navigate the world in a way uh, that never compromised truth and at the same time never failed to love. And that's not an easy tension, okay? And what Paul is calling us here is to reflect that life. Live in a way that you never compromise truth, but that you always look loving, Okay, live in the light of Jesus in all we do. So how do we do that? I think uh, in Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2, summarize it well. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So Paul knows the Ephesians are living in a dark place. And in a lot of ways, the problems... Uh, in the city of Ephesus at the time, parallel the world we're living in today in Sioux Falls in 2023. Same vices, same temptations, same excuses, uh, same justification of unholy and ungodly things in our lives. You do it, I do it, we all, we, we do this, right? And in these first two verses of Ephesians chapter five, Paul gives the church two commands, two reasons for living out those commands. 
And I'm telling you, if you figure these two things out in your life, if you get these right, you will have figured out a way to navigate faith in a culture that will be truly transformational for you. So command number one is that we are to walk in God's footsteps. We're to walk in God's footsteps. The goal of the Christian life is to look more like Jesus. From from the beginning, from creation, God said, let us make man in our image. And in the law, when we read the law, uh, God says, be holy, why? Because I am holy. And so this pursuit of perfection isn't about following a legalistic list of rules. It's about doing everything we can to reflect God to this world. It's, it's following in his footsteps, doing the best to model our lives after Jesus. The best way you can do this is to do everything you can to live in a way that's following in the path he laid out. So the picture is kind of like aligning yourself with Jesus. So uh, again, not a trick question. How many of you, raise hands, how many of you know how to walk? Okay, like lots of you. That's really cool. Congratulations. Um, in walking, you literally just do two repeated steps over and over again. You take, it's never more than that, right? Like you, you first one leg and then the other, and then you're back to the first again. And that's how you walk. And when you're little, you got to think about it. You got to balance, think about balance. Eventually, you just walk. You just put one leg in front of the other. One, two, one, two. Here we're discovering, you know, uh, we talked in a, a series a little while back about what it looks like to walk humbly with God. Here we're discovering what that actually looks like. And so walking is a very perfect picture of these two verses because uh, these are like two steps in walking with Jesus, one in front of the other as we live in obedience to him. So what does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? Well, it, it takes two steps, just like walking. Step number one, we need to choose to walk in the light. Verse eight says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to talk about things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. Now, what you can hear here is the transfer language in this passage. You were part of the realm of the darkness, but now you've been transferred. You're li you were living in darkness. Now you've been transferred to the realm of light. And don't miss the language. It's, it doesn't just say you were living in darkness. It says, once you were darkness. Once you were darkness. But when you're living in darkness, it actually becomes a part of you. But it says, now you are living in him. You're new creatures. You're living in the light. And the light of Christ actually has its presence in us. So now you were darkness. Now you are light. You are living in in the light, okay? And so he's saying to them and to us, you have become the light of Christ. Just be who you are. Live in the light in a dark world. That's the first step. Live in the light in a dark world. Do the things you know are right. When you live, it literally, light exposes darkness. If you're living in the light, just by living your life, you will be exposing the sin in culture, Okay? And there's a tension we have to navigate here. When most Christians read this passage, the passage says, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. When we read that, we tend to think, I gotta take the, I'm gonna take the easy route in obeying this, and I'm just gonna avoid all people living in darkness. The problem with that is where we find Jesus all the time in his ministry is with those that the Pharisees were trying to avoid. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and in order for his light to shine in the darkness of the world, he has to actually be around the darkness of the world. Here's the reality we learn in this passage. It's easier to be a Pharisee than it is to be a follower. It's easier to avoid the world. It's easier to focus on Christian relationships. It's easier to spend all my time with my Christian friends and to pray that God will put me in a Christian workplace so I don't have to deal with the darkness of the world. But when our goal is to avoid the world, we actually lose the ability then to shine our light in the darkness just by living our lives every single day. And we actually fail to walk in his footsteps because imitating God is not only a statement about our lifestyle or the behaviors we live in, it's an invitation to literally follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And while you'll never find Jesus sinning, you'll also never find Jesus avoiding sinners. Somehow, he figured out a way to walk in the tension of life of living every day in a dark place, in a dark world, in a way that always reflected the light of God. 
And for most of us, most Christians lean toward just avoiding people who are living in darkness. And when we do that, we lose our capacity to be the light in the darkness. Now, equally, uh, equally dangerous is the opposite response. More recently, given our hypersensitive cancel culture and some of the things like that, a lot of Christians are actually highly driven by fear. And rather than avoiding the world, they're definitely in it, but they're too afraid to speak truth into the world because they're afraid they'll come off as judgmental. And yet Paul is pretty clear. Christ does have some expectations for us. In chapter uh, verses three and four, it says this, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. In other words, we're actually supposed to address our lifestyle. God knows you're not perfect. God knows you're, you're gonna mess up, but it's his desire that we would be growing in holy living and that we're living changed lives right in the midst of the world around us. And that leads to a second key about Christ, like kind of the second step. So if the first step is walking in the light, the second step, step number two, is walking in wisdom. You wanna walk in the light, then you wanna walk in wisdom. Walk in the light as you walk in wisdom, okay? Verse 15 and se- through 17. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants. Now, I wanna key in on on one word that seems really out of place. It's the word opportunity. So we're commanded to walk in wisdom in this world because people are watching. And people are ready to point the finger of accusation. So we have to understand the world we're living in uh, is ready to point the finger, and yet that can't be our excuse for not living out our faith, okay? And what's interesting is that Paul calls this an opportunity. Did you know the current realities of our culture are actually an opportunity for us as believers to share our faith? See, the word for opportunity here carries with it this idea of redemption, that we are supposed to take the opportunity for redemptive moments. Paul is saying, listen, when the culture around you is at a low point, when culture seems to you to be as lost as you ever remember it being, that's actually when the opportunity to shine is the highest. Most of us, we look at the shift in our culture as obstacles and tough circumstances that make it hard to be a Christian in our culture. And yet, when does light shine the brightest? When it's darkest. Think about it this way. If you weren't under pressure in your life, how could you ever model God's grace in pressure? If you didn't go through trials, how can anyone ever see that God is sufficient for you? If people weren't so lost in life, if they weren't living in such darkness, how much harder would it be for you to shine the light? It was true for Ephesus. It's still true for us today. When people get what they want in life and they realize it didn't make them happy and life is actually empty, that's actually when they become most open to the truth. So this first picture uh, is living in the light and in wisdom, in the light and in wisdom. And yet as we look at Christ, what we see is someone who did not justify or tolerate sin. He spent the majority of his time with sinners. And he did it out of the overflow of his overwhelming love he has for the lost. And by the way, that includes you and me. That's why it says in verse one, we are to imitate God in everything we do because we're his dear children. Do you know that children are natural imitators? Sometimes that's great. I mean, not always. So Tucker, our eight-year-old, he's adopted. Um, He uh, doesn't look exactly like us. If you met him, you know, you know. And all the time, all the time, people, strangers come up to me and they say, is this, your, is this your son? Oh my gosh, he looks so much like you. And he does. But because of his mannerisms. See, children imitate and they emulate their parents automatically. They often do what they see their parents do, which, as you know, is not always good. Okay? If, they, if you see a behavior in your kids and you don't like it and you're like, where did that come from? Probably from you. And this is something our kids do because of the love they have for their parents. To your little kids, you are the greatest force in their lives. And this is the part I think most Christians are missing. We're striving to follow God's example, but we've forgotten we're dearly loved children. And so we've, for, we've forgotten that 
we're just emulating our daddy. Okay, we often take steps of obedience, not out of love, but out of obligation because we know we should. You know, we serve because we, we know that we have to. We give because we know we're supposed to. We do what his word says out of obligation or because we're trying to earn God's approval. And we forget we've already been adopted as kids. We're, we're not living as spiritual orphans. We're, we're living, we're, our job is to follow the example of our heavenly father, to walk in his footsteps. But not living our lives, you know, most of us are living our lives, in, in, we're not living it in the context of his love for us. And that brings us to our second command of the passage. Uh, look at verse one and two again. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So command number two is just walk in God's love. Walk in God's love. God's longing for us is that we would learn to walk with him in love. This journey with Jesus isn't a sprint, it's a daily walk, and if the first step we're called to take is into Christ-likeness, the second step is into love. So that we're constantly walking in love and Christ-likeness in everything we do. So what does that look like in our lives? Well, Paul describes it in Scripture. It's a Scripture you may be familiar with. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we often read at weddings. Did you know Paul didn't write that for your wedding? He actually wrote it to the church as a command about how we're supposed to live. And this is what he says. He says, love is patient and kind Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And that's the kind of love we're called to as believers. We tend to struggle in balancing this idea of love with this idea of Christ likeness because to the world, if you tell me what I'm doing is wrong, it's the same as telling me you hate me as a person. To the world, love equals acceptance. You, you accept me just as I am. That's the only way you can love me. But as Christians, like it or not, we can't define love that way. We have to walk in both love and in Christ likeness. We have to love enough to meet people where they are but we also have to love them enough to shine the light of Jesus in all we do, even when it's not popular and even when it's not what people want to hear. And we have to understand this tension is our calling, okay? We have to do it with patience and with kindness and with humility, not with arrogance or rudeness. We have to stand on our commitment to Christ, but not demand a relationship on our terms. We're called to walk in a way that stands on God's truth, but is not offended when standing on that truth causes the world to wrong us or to, to say bad things about us. We just keep loving. We never give up on God's truth. We never give up on those we're called to reach because we love both with all we are. We love God's truth and we love God's people. So here's my question for you today. Does love define your life? This is Paul's message to everyday ordinary Christians. God's truth should define your lifestyle, and Christ's love should define your living. What do I mean by that? God's truth should set the boundaries for our lives, and God's love should show in every single action we take. In fact, Jesus even said, we be known in the world by our love for each other. And you might say, well, Pastor Phil, the world doesn't give me a chance to love, right? The minute they hear I'm a Christian, they assume I'm judgmental. Well, what are you doing to undo that assumption? Because the only way someone can continue to assume something about you is if you haven't put any effort to get to know them and to love them in a way that begins to melt away those assumptions. Here's what I've come to believe about a lot of Christians. Most Christians actually walk with a spiritual limp. Either we walk heavy in truth, but lacking in grace and love, or we're so afraid of offending that we try to love and we walk so heavy in, in grace that we're not actually living in a way that's shining the light of truth into a dark world. And what's so amazing about the example Christ left us is that while he never sinned, he was always with sinners and he lived among people in a way that left them with no question what he stood for and at the same time, no question that he loved them desperately. How do I need to live so that I'm living in a way that the world knows 
what I stand for and knows I love them desperately. Because it's that love that ultimately led Christ to the cross. And it's that kind of love he's expecting out of us as well. That's why verse two says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Listen, Jesus came to give himself for us. That's why he came. He knew what it would cost him to stand on the truth and he knew what it would cost him to choose to love humanity despite, of our, despite our response. He knew the betrayal and the mocking and the beatings were coming and he came into a dark world shining his light and his light ultimately brought life to others. And by the way, so should yours. So let me, let me ask you this. What does your spiritual limp look like? Do you find yourself heavy on truth but lacking in grace? Do you find it hard to love those who don't think and act like you? If that's you, God wants to heal your limb. Maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you're heavy on grace and light on truth, and while that can feel like the loving thing, it's not. Real love tells the truth, even when the truth is hard. And if you find it hard to stand on truth, God wants to heal that limb as well. Because living in the light means following God's footsteps and walking in wisdom, and you can't do either fully with a limp. So perhaps this morning for you is just about praying for a softer heart. God, soften my heart. I, I hold on to your truth so tightly, but soften my heart. Help me to love like you love. Maybe for you it's about praying for a firmer commitment to the truth. God, I love people, but help me love your truth too. Walking is always one foot in, the, in front of the other. So I want to pray for you today that whatever you're struggling with, God will give you the courage to walk in the light and to do so without a limp. Father, help us realize that the most loving thing is actually grace and truth. And help us learn how to walk in both in everything we do. I pray this in your name. Amen.